great turnout. We are in for a super, 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 uh, super excellent presentation today. I just have to tell you that I have been in the business for 13 years and for 13, I'll say 12 months and a, 12 years and a month, I've been using La Roque inspections. They have been by far the only inspection company that I've ever worked with. And I won't work with anyone else because of their level of expertise and their level of commitment and their professionalism is just, is state of the art. It, it's, it's a hard act to follow and I endorse them all the way around the block. And I am really fortunate and blessed to have them as an expert participant in my radio show and here in my business in its totality. So I'm really, really honored and very excited to introduce to you John LaRocca, who is going to be presenting to us today this very, very controversial subject about unpermitted construction, which how many of you guys are dealing with this? Unpermitted instruction, construction. Okay, just about everybody, right? So Without further ado, I'd like to bring John on. The subject today is unpermitted construction. And uh, we'll start out with just looking at, well, when is a permit required? And that is any alteration, repairs, or modifications to the mechanical or structural systems of the building, or which is a permit, permitting unpermitted construction. So what does that mean? So you have some unpermitted construction that, that, that got done. You're required to get a permit for it now. That's just, it's always a standard situation that you build something, you should get a permit. So if it's built and it's unpermitted, then you really should be getting a permit. So those are the three times you really have to look at getting a permit. And when you're dealing with it as a, as a real estate agent, obviously these things come up. And that's why you're here today, because you, you've confronted that situation. All right, why are building permits needed? All right, well, they're basically needed because you want to see that things are meeting current codes because we want to make sure that it's up to date from that standpoint. And codes are in place basically to ensure that buildings meet minimum safety standards. And it's minimum safety standards, okay? You have to do at least this much. And hopefully if you're if a good builder is there, you're doing better than that. But this just basically puts the minimum standards there, okay? All right, so safety issues such as exposure to carbon monoxide. And let's see, if I don't have a pointer on this. All right, so that little vent right there, is very close to that window. So when that window is open and someone's running the heater, that's a heating vent, uh, those fumes could be going right into the building. That's a no-no, okay? Flat out, not okay, and exposure to the carbon monoxide. Here's another one. Can anybody tell me what they think is wrong with that? Yeah? Pipe is running down. It's running down. Ding, 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 ding. You're the first person that's ever got that. It's, and we've done this quite a bit. This pipe, this is a water heater, right? Now the water heater has a burner in the bottom. This, this is a gas fire one. And it's supposed to basically float up the, you know, it should just rise. It's like a chimney, it would just rise. But if you go downhill, what happens is it backs up and it spills out here in that little area there, which means you're now getting carbon monoxide into the building, into your home. This is, this is someone's laundry room where they have, have a laundry room next to this a heater and water heater, okay? So that's an unsafe condition. That's pretty obvious. Someone came in and stabbed in some wiring in the, in the electrical panel. Of course, that's a fire hazard. Um, this is also combining gases, which is a, also a no-no. People, this is, this is the vent going down into a bathroom. So you, know, you turn the light on, the fan comes on, and it's going here into, into that, that vent. Not okay, all right? First of all, it's going from a big vent to a small vent, which also causes backup, and that will, gases will come back. <coughs> this is a short chimney. Top of the chimney, top of the roof. <laughs> it's an obvious problem here, yeah, that's why this is black. You know, because it's black because of the fact that that's, well, every time you have a chimney, a fire in a chimney, you're gonna have smoke and products of combustion and heat coming up there. And you can't see the picture very well, unfortunately. I took this picture from standing on the street, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't know whose house it was. It wasn't our inspection, we were inspecting next door. And I saw this, I had to take a picture. But right here, you can see, barely see a line there. This is a vent, which means the gases are also going into the house. <laughs> so that's a pretty bad situation. This is a short step. You can see with the heel of the shoe is too, too short. 
and these actually cause obviously a trip hazard coming down, especially you can lose your balance and down. All right, so when does construction not have to conform with current building code? There is one time, one basic concept, and that is grandfathering. Oh. Okay. I'm going to give you the real definition of grandfather because everybody here has probably heard that word and probably have heard it and had it defined incorrectly. They go, well, it's been in 50 years, so it's grandfather day. No, uh, sorry. If a, if a permit was obtained when something was originally constructed, it does not have to conform with future changes in codes. That's grandfather. But in order to be grandfather day, you have to have had a permit when it was built. No permit when it was built, no grandfather clause. It doesn't apply. Just because it's sitting there for 30, 40, 50, 60 years and no one said anything about it does not mean it's automatically okay. We've all heard this one, right? Oh, it's been there 50 years. It's okay. Who cares? You know? Well, technically, it's not okay. It's only grandfather that had a permit. Now, of course, there are, the governments do override some of these things. They make you put in things like, you know, water heater strapping and uh, and it was permitted at, the, at one time originally when you didn't have to have permit, the, the strapping, but now you have to have strapping, so now it's a, you know, it, it's something that, that gets imposed by the government. Carbon monoxide testing, you know, smoke detectors, you know, impact hazard glazing, all those things. All right, here we go. In 1935, this chimney was built to code, so it is now grandfathered in, even though it does not meet today's standards. Okay, so what's today's standards that we're not meeting here? If you look at this chimney over here, this chimney is at least two feet above the height of the roof, and it has a little uh, weather cap on top and a screen. That's the current code. This does not meet that code. It's too short. Okay. So, but at the time when that was built, it was okay. Are we going to change that? No. You know, it's been there since 1935, so it hasn't been a fire yet. So we're not have, not that concerned. But, and they can't make you do it in that situation. Uh, the city might try to sometimes, but typically, if you're grandfathered in, it's okay. Uh, unless, of course, the government comes along and says all chimneys have now have to be two feet above, regardless of whatever you was built. But that hasn't happened yet. Everybody got that? Okay, good. Here's one. This kitchen was upgraded without permits. Okay? And we've, we probably have all heard this one when say, oh yeah, well, they built it to code, but they didn't get a permit. Right? Have you heard this one? Well, that's what happened here. It was built code to code, but without a permit. Well, that's not okay. First of all, in order to be the code, you have to have a permit. It's the first page of the permit book it says, I'm uh, getting, a, getting a, a permit. You have to have, you know, get a permit to start out with. So you can't be the code without having a permit. And that one never had a permit. And whenever this got, this got done, of course, there was electrical changes, there were plumbing changes, like if you. Uh, there was uh, structural changes, they moved the wall around. A whole lot of things happened here that should have been looked at by building inspectors. Yes, I had a question back there. Question? Oh, I just was wondering, what was the permit that they would need for? Electric, plumbing, structural, you know, because yeah. the old little things that happened, they're all new appliances, it's new washing machine, new, new sink, new faucets, all that stuff had to be looked at by a plumber. Make sure it was, plumb, it was plumbed properly, that the wiring was done properly, that that lighting in the ceiling was done properly. All that has to be looked at by a building permit, building inspector. Yes. If uh, we're selling a property that they say is up to code, no permits, and we go bring an inspector in post work to get permits, can you do that? Yeah. Yes, and I'm going to show you how. Okay. All right. That's part of what we're going to talk about. All right. So you got the concept here. All right. Good. Other issues with unpermitted work is occupancy issues, zoning issues, and variances, as you brought up a little earlier. Okay? Now, what is occupancy? Occupancy basically is the way a property is used and the allowable number of occupants and the required number of parking spaces are all defined by occupancy rules. That's where it comes from. This is a food processing uh, plant in a garage. That's no bueno. <laughs> All right, so you know you, when you're inspecting the house and you go in there and you find out that they're doing this in the in the garage, you have to realize this is now okay with the building building inspection. All right, now question. Yes. Oh, yes. Question. I'm sorry. Is there a regulation says that how many people has to have to live in one bedroom? 
no? Yes, well, not so much how many people have to live there, because as many as you like, how really. Many people but are the limit? You know, I don't know of any code that gives a limit to the amount of people that live there. The, the zoning rule that talks about occupancy really talks about the maximum number of units, not necessarily the maximum number of people. <laughs> One unit, 25 people, okay. I don't know, maybe that happens. <laughs> Hopefully not in our neighborhood. Anyway. All right, here we go. So back to, going backwards. Zoning rules. Now zoning dictates the type of structures that can be built on a lot, as well as the buildable area of the lot, and the maximum height of the structure, and the required setbacks for the side, rear, and front yard. So this is basically the zoning regulations, okay? And it sets all these things down. Now, if you sell properties in Venice, which you probably have sold them, these rules don't apply so much anymore. Well, because they were built before these codes were in place. Okay, so they have a right to not conform. But don't go try and get a building permit for a second story on because now you're going to be in a whole new Now you have to come up with new codes. All right? But <coughs> are there variances to that? We're going to get into that. But yes, some certain things can happen. But generally, the basic codes with regards to zoning dictate these issues. Or how high the building can be, how much area of the lot you can make a house or, or a building on it, and where those things can be. Like, for example, when you have a garage on the property line, like this one is, you have to be at least 10 feet away from the house, for example. That's like a requirement, okay? All right. Variances, your question. Now, unfamiliar work may involve the non-conforming situations that must apply, and you must apply for a variance in order to get those things to be okay. If you want to get them termed as okay and, and, and not to be in compliance, not complying, but in compliance, uh, it is basically an exception to the rules, uh, and you have the right to not conform. And that's what, that's what variance gives you. Now, this particular situation was, it was a garage, and somebody wanted to put living in Well, it was actually a garage with a storage space above, and then they made it into an apartment. Storage space was okay because it was not living area, but as soon as you put an apartment up there, now you have a, now you come back into the, into these rules. If there's going to be a living space, it has to have five foot setback, 15 foot setback, 20 foot setback here. It's right on the property line. Now you can't make that into living area because it's right on the property line. It doesn't it doesn't conform. Now they actually got that one to conform, and how they do that? Well. There are some ways to do some of these things. There are variables that can be that can be applied with architects and engineers involved. And in this case, they had to build a one-hour separation on both sides on the property line, which means that wall assembly on those two sides of the building that were on the property line had to have a one-hour fire separation. So that if there was a fire there, it would take an hour to burn through, which is plenty of time for the fire department to come put the fire out. And that's what that rule is all about. So what did they put there? They the wall had to be built with double drywall on both sides, uh, both plaster on one side, double drywall on the inside, fire fire rated drywall, and they ended up getting what they call a two-hour assembly. And when you get, if you, there are these kinds of things that can be done, but you have to get an engineer and you have to get an architect involved, otherwise the city won't even talk to you. They're not going to solve your problem for you. The city will not solve your problem for you. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> Which you may have already already experienced. What's that? I'm sure we all know that. You all, have, you all know that one. Okay, so I'm not telling you that you don't know on that one. All right, so the three options dealing with unpermitted construction, this is partly why we're here today, is you can do nothing. All right, that's one option. Do nothing. The other option is to restore the building to its original permit condition. That's another option. And the third option is go through the process of legalizing the unpermitted work. So those are your three options. I'm going to tell you how you handle those three options. Number one. If you do nothing, in this case, the buyer accepts the unpermitted construction as it exists. There it is. This is what you get. You either keep it or not keep it. It's up to you. If they like it, fine. But I suggest that you get some, something in writing. You just basically have to disclose. And I would suggest you get it in writing and say, we love it and we don't care. It's not permitted. And if something happens, I'll never come after you. And you sign, sign it in blood so that you don't get sued. Which could happen, because you know? sometimes pe people. Realize, I didn't realize it would cost me thirty thousand dollars to fix this problem. Now they're happy. They're happy. You know? 
that's that's a that's a problem. All right. So in this situation, a do nothing situation, the buyer has decided to keep this uncommitted garage. This garage got converted to a beautiful uh, den, and they didn't want to change that. So they accepted it the way it was. So that was okay. But then. Number two, the option two, is restoring the property back to its original permanent condition. This would require obtaining the proper permits too, by the way. If, you have, if you're changing things that are plumbing and electrical, then you have to get permits for that. But making it back to the original condition basically is no, you know, no harm, no foul in that situation. Yes? Did you have any uh, experience of some of the uh, city to come and uh, you know, demolish the uh, the city is not going to demolish anything for you uh, or for anybody unless, of course, it is deemed as a hazard. Let's say the example I, I could think of on that would be like, let's say it was when something went to foreclosure, it was a pretty dilapidated property to begin with, so they moved in and, you know, it was, became a crack house and they threw them out and the place is completely a mess and a fire hazard. They might take that down and send a bill to the owner. That might happen. It's pretty rare, but that could happen. Okay. Did everybody get that qu qu question or not get that question? Could you I mean, repeat it? We could hear. Well, would she asked, would they, the city ever come out and demolish a piece of unpermitted construction? It's very rare, but it could happen. And I cited that one example that might might occur. Yeah, you know, we might decide it's just a public nuisance and a hazard. Yes. They just keep on giving you uh, fines and everything, don't they? Oh yeah. Cities, cities tax money, and then, and they will tax you and find you. Yes. Is there a reason you would give a buyer um, not to do nothing? Like, if they wanted that garage and they loved it as it was, what is the biggest reason not to do nothing? Not to do nothing, or to do nothing? Or to, I'm sorry, to do nothing. I mean, what 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 is the biggest red flag on that? Is it that if they in future wanted to add on to the house, then the city would get be involved with it? What is your reason for? Um, why you shouldn't leave something alone like that without permission? I'm not sure I answer your question. Why, why can you tell a buyer, what would you tell a buyer about leaving something? Oh, okay. What's the risk involved? Yeah. All right. So what are the risks involved if you leave something unpermitted? You're not getting a loan. Well, it could be a loan situation. Of course, that would be number one. You couldn't even buy the property at that point. So that wouldn't be, you know, that wouldn't be uh, a deal. You wouldn't have a deal at that particular point. You have no money in the cash. Um, so... If you leave something, the risks involved are somebody could rat you out, you know, neighbor could say something, or let's say you had a tenant in there, and they didn't want to leave, and you wanted them to leave, and they call the city and make trouble for you. That could happen. Um, or the city could drive by and snoop around, which is really rare. The city has more to do than they, than they have people for, and they don't go looking for work. Guaranteed, they don't go looking for work. Um, so those, I mean, the, the risks are pretty low, really, in most cases, unless it's a real obvious situation where, and I'm going to show you some obvious situations. We'll have some pictures here. Do you see a lot of unpermitted garages? Oh, this unpermitted garages and, and dead, uh, back patios turned into dens. This is the most common thing you guys run into, right? I mean, that's the most common one. Yes? I'm not sure you can answer this, but a lot of situations I've seen is where they they're advertising it as a larger unit, like a four-bedroom. City yeah. records show two bedroom, square footage shows city records X amount, and they're showing X amount, and they're going by X amount, and they don't have no knowledge, the center has no knowledge of if anything has ever been changed or not, this is how it is. Yeah, there's, a, the there's a lot of variables there. Of course, if you, if you have any bank owned sales or things like that, they have no disclosure requirements, right? So it might be four bedrooms that you're looking at, but it may already only be a three bedroom house on the records with regards to the legal description, with regards to the tax involved. So yeah, there can be these, and they're often, and many times there are these kinds of discrepancies. I lived in a house personally I owned for years, 13 years I owned that house, and lived in it, and it said it had two bedrooms, a bathroom room. I had one bathroom. I went search for that second bathroom. <laughs> Many. <laughs> but on the tax roll, it said two bathrooms, and I, you know, always laugh about it because you know it's, there wasn't two bathrooms there. Anyway, uh, these are these are situations that are discrepancies we see all the time with regards to tax rolls, rolls with regards to city permits, with regards to what the what the appraiser might say. He might say it's only fourteen hundred square feet, but if it, but they have it at sixteen hundred square feet. We had one not so long ago, and it happens pretty commonly where. 
you know, it, the garage was, uh, they put a bathroom halfway into the garage and took up some of the garage area. You know, those kinds of things happen all the time. They're not legal. They're absolutely not legal. Got to hand that over. If your tax roll says two bathrooms and you add a bathroom and it's not permitted. Well, anytime we add something not permitted, you have that problem. Uh, of course, nothing would change on the tax roll if I just yeah. put a second bathroom in. But, you know, I, I never did. I left the house before that. Before I bought it doing that. I had to hand a paper. Um, could there be an insurance issue? There could be an insurance issue. That's actually another uh, situation, by the way. I, I should have brought this up. Uh, leaving something unpermitted does leave insurance issues. If something happened, God forbid, a fire and somebody got killed, this would not be covered by the insurance. They could easily deny that claim, and that could leave you a huge liability. And if that fire spread to the property, they may not cover that situation. So you do run into situations where insurance companies, if they find out that something was unpermitted or because every fire, by the way, you should know this, every fire gets investigated and they have to find out, they have to determine the source of the fire. And if the source of the fire comes out as being faulty wearing because it was unpermitted construction, the insurance company will know that. They're going to hear about that. And they may deny a point. So that is a liability. Yes? Um, what are those signs based on? Let's say that vehicle conversion in that garage is equal to looks like it's up to go. They want to raise the roof and do a second story with a permit. The inspector comes, they see the garage, they have great. But what do they base the fine on? Is it completely arbitrary or is there a. You know, it depends on what city you're in and how they're going to determine those kinds of things. So you have to check with the city on that you're doing. Is it thousands of dollars or a slap on the wrist or what you're dumping out? Typically, what, I can tell you that typically what happens is if you leave something unpermitted and they find out about it, they're going, if you leave something unpermitted and they find out about it, they're going to issue a red tag, basically. And they're going to say, you know, no, a notice to comply. You have to comply with, with if I converting it back to whatever. They'll, they'll write it up tell you what they have to do. If you don't do anything about it, they step up the gradient. It goes then to the legal department. It goes to the city attorney's office. And if you don't do anything about it, they will actually press charges. You know, they will do a civil case against you. So that's where you really end up paying. Now, if you go to get the permit to convert something that was unpermitted and make it into a permitted situation, you're going to pay a fine there. Usually three times the cost of the general permit. Three times the cost of a normal permit. So if the permit was 500 bucks, you'd pay 1500. That's typical, and that again, that varies from city to city. All right. So those are the kinds of things that they, they, they that they do. They, typically, these fines are not tremendous. They're not very very large. Typically, of course. Yes. Yeah. So when flood made like nine to you know for a commercial garage. Change it to take off everything yes. three times. <laughs> <laughs> Persistent little bugger, huh? <laughs> so in Santa Monica, they have a, a, a garage that was converted to a bedroom, office. Or something, an office bedroom, and the city of Santa Monica made it converted back to a garage. This is typical, okay? But then having it happen two or three times, well, that means the guy keeps putting it back to, to an office space, which obviously he's pretty tenacious. Yes. I have a client who may want to sell one of his houses in Calabasas, and the builder was building several houses on this street, and the public record says it's a five bedroom, six bathroom house in whatever square feet. Uh, while it was being built, it burned down to the ground. So the builder rebuilt a seven bedroom, nine bathroom house with an extra thousand square feet. So if my client, who is not obviously not going to restore it to what the public record says, he should probably get a variance for it, would be his only option. Yeah, I guess that's a pretty, pretty unusual situation with the fire and all that kind yeah. of thing. Um, in order to build a thousand square feet, you have to get a building permit to do foundation work and to do the construction. They did, I don't think they refiled any of the... Okay, so if, they, if you didn't get a permit for the new plan, right. and the plan is different than what was submitted to the city, right. that's where your rough is going to be, right, right there. You know, so that's what, the rough. So and what do we do about it? What do you do about it? You can live with it the way it is and hope for the best. You know, you can restore it back to the original condition, which you're not going to take out the thousand square feet probably. <laughs> You know, or you go for variance. Those are all your three options. Okay. You know, and they could go for variance. Right. Okay. You know, and, and 
My experience with most cities, and Calabasas is not one of the easiest ones to deal with on these situations, uh, is that, you know they're willing to listen. You know they're willing to say, okay, so they're they're reasonable in most cases. If you're dealing with the upper level inspectors, not the guys who come out to to, to, to look at the property, because they are pretty much just going to say it's not okay. But you can talk to planners and senior planners, and you might be able to work something out with them. So, and if you want to talk to, I'll be right with you. If you want to talk to a senior planner, and I'm going to go into this a little bit as we move along here, uh, you don't have to give them the address. You can go in anonymously and just say, "I have this house. Here's the plan. This is what it looks like. You don't have a street address. You don't have a name. Just say, I want to do this. Will this work?" And he'll tell you yes or no, or whatever, you know. But you don't have to tell him what address you're talking about. So you can get away with that. Yeah, have him. My question sort of goes along with that. If you go for a variance on a permitted construction and they don't grant it, does that open up a can of worms? Yes. Mm -hmm. It means you're in non-compliance. Know, everyone knows you're in non-compliance if you're filing for a variance. It's already up front. You know, if this is like why you're here, you know, at the building department. You have a non-complying situation and you're trying to get it to be okay to not comply. You have, you know, once you you're trying to get them to grant them a non-compliant situation. And that happens. It, it, it can be done, depending on what it is. They won't let you say, for example, in Venice is a good example. You know, they're such small lots. If you convert that garage to a living area, there's no place to put a garage. They're not going to allow that. You know, you have to have parking, yeah, covered parking. In fact, you have to have enclosed parking. If your buyer decides to move into something like, say, an unpermitted garage conversion, yeah. and then they later decide they want to permit it just to be safe for insurance reasons or whatever, are they going to get fined even though they weren't the ones that yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. The owner of the property, regardless of how many times, how many owners were before you, wherever it happened, when you go to get the building permit now, you will pay all the fees and you will pay any any you know fines and have to do whatever it takes to bring up the current code. It's one of the reasons why you want to get a building permit because codes do change and get stricter. And then we get, get laxed. Then we get stricter. So as things go on, there'll be more things you have to do. And they become more expensive. You know, there's all kinds of wiring now in, be in bedrooms that was never a, a code five years ago. But now the wiring is much more expensive to do because they have certain ground fault situations and whatnot. Hand back there. If you want are looking to get something permitted like there's a property and it's four bedrooms two bathrooms and an unpermitted bathroom and that's what you want the city planner to uh, permit and there's also a garage you know there's an unpermitted conversion but you don't want that looked at you just Specifically, one thing, are you opening up a can of worms? Yeah. Well, let's just say you're rolling the, rolling the dice. Rolling the dice, okay. You know, because if the building inspector is going to come and look at something, he could see something else, and that could be tagged at that particular point. He might not see it, and you might get away with it, but it is rolling the dice. Yes? So if he does come onto the property, he doesn't have the right to kind of look at the entire property if that's not what you want. Okay, so the question is, if a building inspector comes on the property, does he have the right to look at other things on the property? He absolutely does. He absolutely does. Okay, just want to let you know that. He's negligent if he doesn't. No, not necessarily. He can come and just, you know, do surgically an inspection. Oh, look at this, the leaf. He can do that. Really? But he has the right to walk around and to look at other things and make comments. He has that right. He is with the building department, and you're talking about a building, and he wants to see that what violations may or may not be there. Now, he may not be able to enforce certain things because he may be grandfathered in. You know, he might have, you know, something that is not up to code anymore, or currently, but it was okay when it was built. And he can say something about it, but you don't have to do anything about that. So, the, you know, there are variables here, but the question of whether or not he can look at other things, he absolutely can. Okay? Oh, question. question. If somebody changed like three things, they put in a tankless water heater, a new heater, and a <coughs> remodel an attached garage into a room, and they called uh, to get everything permitted, you said it would be three times the cost of the original permit. Yeah. Would that be times three, or just three times the cost of the permit one time for those three items? It would be cost of the, three times the cost of the permit of all the things you're permitting. 
total amount. Yeah, I mean, if you're permitting this and it has a permit fee of five hundred dollars, you pay fifteen hundred. And I would say, and that does vary by different cities, but that's generally the general rule of thumb. Okay, everybody get that? Did we miss that back there? Okay. The question is, if you had two or three different things that were being uh, currently brought up to new code and permitted, would you have to pay a fee on each one of those things? The answer is yes. You know, whatever you're permitting, whatever you bring up the code, that's a, you'd have to get a permit for and you'd have to pay the fees and fines. All right, so option two is get prop permits, option three. Oh, this, this is an example of option number two. This was a converted garage. This, they had put a window here. I'm sorry you can't see it that well. But that was a window. You can see the driveway where it goes right up to the window. It used to be a garage door. And now they converted it back to garage door. And, uh, but they're still using it as a, as a rec room, which you can. Probably 99% of all the garages in, in, in the country are used for something other than parking cars in. You know, storage of things and whatever. They don't care whatever you put in it, they just care that you can put a car in it. That's the requirement. Not that you use it for a car, that it can be used for a car. That means the driveway has to be wide enough. That means the garage door has to be there and operable. It can't be nailed shut, which happens sometimes. But you can have a window for a... Yeah, you can have a window in a garage, as long as that window isn't going into the house area, because that would mean a fire could go through the wall. Are we all good? Mm -hmm. All right, ask questions back. So you convert the garage into something that, say, the garage lift, the door lifts, and, you know, people, you could get the car in, but say you convert the garage into a room, and you then can't put a car in, is that... If you put a permanent structure in there that blocks the access for a vehicle, you have caused a violation. Even if you put a, a washer and dryer out there in an area that was not designed for that, like some of the small tight garages, and they put a washer and dryer in that encroaches on the area where a car could park, that actually technically is a violation. Will they do something about it? Usually not. You know, because they don't care what you put in the garage as long as you can get in the garage. But if you built a room there with walls and electrical and those kinds of things, that would be more serious than putting your washer and dryer. Because the washer and dryer thing happens a lot. All right, so number three is take your required steps to legalize some unpermitted work. You do this, uh, to do this, you, mean you have to meet the city planner, provide detailed plans, you have to actually show them plans, and pull the new permit uh, for the unpermitted construction. All right, so <coughs> meet with the planner, Show them what you got. You have a little plan, you have to show them what you got. And then you're going to provide the detailed drawings of everything. You know, that the planning part is preliminary. This is now detailed. Now you have to go to a plan check uh, situation. And they want everything there. Which way doors swing, how big a door is, everything. You know, all the height of windows. Because the size of a window is re in relationship to the size of the room. Because we have energy situations, you know, we don't want to have, have too many windows because of energy saving the conservation and whatnot. It's called Title 24. You may have heard about that, but those are all many calculations that have to be going going into any kind of construction that's being built, especially if it has if it's habitable. More that's more serious when it's habitable. If it's just a garage or a storage space, of course, you can go out and buy a storage shed and put it anywhere on your property. You know, nobody cares. But if you're going to make it habitable and people live in it, then that becomes a situation. Okay, you have to follow for the building permits and pay the fees and, of course, fines if there are fines involved. You can have a licensed contractor, bonded contractor, uh, and, and licensed, of course, uh, come out and do the work, or you can become an owner builder. You can do things yourself on any residence. If you build it, you want to build it yourself, you can build it. It's okay, as long as you follow follow the codes. And you get the proper inspections. Inspections have to be done. So, you know, here's our handy dandy guy, and he's reading a little book on how to put the pipe together, and he puts the pipe together, and it's all fine. Yes? So, doesn't that mean that when there's construction, if it's, if it's unpermitted work, such as a conversion of uh, a garage or a new structure that's been done unpermitted, you're really going to be needing to take down a lot of the walls and, you know, in order to get the sign off on the electrical and the plumbing that's already in there, correct? All right, so how much of the walls? or whatever, you know, ceiling, whatever, that they want you to expose is up to the inspector. 
he might say, well, I want to see how this wall has the plumbing in it. I want to see how that wall has electrical in it. Just open up certain areas for me. The biggest problem, by the way, with garage conversions are twofold. One is the depth of foundations do not comply with residents. Okay, it's usually, if it's a separate garage, now in this situation, let me go back to this plan. In this plan, you see, this is a garage that's incorporated with the whole house. Typically that foundation would be probably built the same as the rest of the house, which means it's, it's palatable space, same, same type of foundation, same width, same depth. But a lot of the other ones, like that garage in the corner, that wouldn't have much of a foundation underneath this. Okay? And it will be right on the ground, which is the other violation. On the slab? Yes, the slab has to be, if it's a slab on grade, which means the concrete is right on the ground, yeah. it has to be four inches above the grade. Mm. Most garages are not four inches above grade. They may be, some, some are, you know, the people ramp up into the garage. But that is the, 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 the most common violation that you can hardly get around unless you read with the floor, you know, or lower the ground, right. <laughs> you have to do something. So, you know, and that's where the variances come in, you know, they say, okay, good, you know, we'll let you have that because that's not been a problem and they can see the water's not getting in. I mean, they, they, they do have some judgment that they can use if they, if they choose, okay? So be nice to them, honestly, <laughs> you know. You start standing on, 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 you know, going, this is the, I want the, you know, you know, they'll just shut down and they'll be, okay, goodbye. See you in scene court. Yeah. Would it help to give the physical inspector a copy of uh, the architectural plan or the permits so that maybe he can make a suggestion or an evaluation or is that beyond your scope? Okay. So the question is, what, does it make any sense to have plans and any other permit documents available for, or given to the inspector. Uh, that depends on the inspector. I'll tell you our company policy is we don't get involved in the permits and we don't get involved in the plans and that kind of thing because there's too much liability in that, in that just like it would be for you guys as real estate professionals. We have our job and our job does not include evaluating those kinds of things. Will I do that if they ask me? Most of the time I will. I'll at least look at it. I won't, and I'm not going to not help somebody. I'm there to help the best I possibly can. And so are my inspectors. So <coughs> we'll, do, we'll do what we can. Uh, but we're not going to make any determinations or decisions or any, take any firm stand about something. We can make suggestions. Uh, we might say, well, you might be able to do this with that. You know, but we're not going to make any, any, any official statement that you can say, well, the inspector said that you can do that or not. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. You know. That becomes dangerous for all of us, you know. All right, we have uh, fees, and then you become, uh, we're back to the point where we're talking about having an owner build situation, because you can't do that on a residential, and rarely you could do it in commercial. I can do it because I'm a building contractor, and I had that cities allow me to do construction, even though I wasn't officially the contractor. I'd hire somebody, but I personally own my own, have my own license, so they allowed me to do that. All right, owner builder responsibilities. If you do become an owner builder, there are very important things to know. You have to pull all the permits, you have to adhere to all the codes, and go through all the inspection process. Ideally, all subcontractors are licensed and carry their own liability insurance, okay? But if not, it's a good idea to provide the workers' compensation, because you can get a rider on your home home policy on these kinds of things. It's not that uncommon, they're familiar with it. Most, most insurance companies, home, home insurance companies that, do, that, that insure homes are familiar with the situation, they can help you with that. And then if you use anyone other than the immediate family, uh, who is a licensed contractor, for example, <coughs> he's considered an employee, which means you will have to have work on compensation. And you may have to file a 1099, you may be responsible for taxes, and nobody wants that. I mean, that's just way too complicated. You with me? Okay, so we still have one that. Okay, so there you are. Now, what would you su suggest to do in the following cases? Which of the three options would you do? You're gonna, you're gonna leave this thing situation. Are you going to get a permit for it or file for a variance? So here, let's, here's some examples. Okay, there's no landing, nothing to stand on. Basically, no standard landing in out in front of that, front of that door. Now, anybody know what the problem, do you see the problem? You know what the problem is? In other words, 
you, you have to you hear you got your baby and your packages and you're coming up and, and you open that door and you have to step back three steps to open the door because that door opens towards you instead of landing there flat landing where you can you know safely hold something and open the door and get in your house so that would have to be handled now there's a driveway here so of course they didn't want to encroach on the driveway but you can do that you can turn that sideways and have the steps go up this way of course you have an air conditioning there so you have to go the other way but uh, there are always, you know, almost always a, a way to solve the problem, all right? So this one, what would you do? Would you go ahead and legalize it, restore it, or leave it alone? Yeah, you restore it. Yeah. Do they let you um, change the way the door opens? Yes. But most exterior doors are going to have an outswinging door with a screen because the inside door is going to want to open in. But you have a screen on the outside, that's going to have to open out. You can't open the same way. Unless you have a screen. You can have a sliding screen. That's right. Solve the problem that way. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. See, there's always solutions. It's not always, but you typically. So they allow you, though, you are legally, you're allowed to actually have a door open in, and then you yes. have to get a Yes. You can't change the swing of the door. Yeah, that, that. I mean, of course, if there may be some situation where it wouldn't work very right. well. It might block something else or whatever. And then that might be with light switches. You have to open the door against the light switches to close the door to turn the light on. That's they don't like that. No, it's not correct. All right, here. What are we doing this one? <coughs> Somebody enclosed the staircase. <laughs> <laughs> they decided to rent the upstairs, so they closed off the downstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. <laughs> so. Your new buyer comes along and he goes, I don't care, I want to rent the space out just like they did, so he, he lives with it. Or you do something else, you convert it back or whatever. No variance needed here, just remove the wall and no harm, no foul. All right, we're going to short chimney situation, what would you do? You can help do anything. I mean, you, it's up to your buyer. If your buyer wants to fix it and make it safer, that's fine, that's up to them. That's on them, it's not going to be on the owner. Because the owner does not have to comply with anything. There's nothing to comply with. Yeah. So I have to put a screen on it. <coughs> yeah, but you know what? It wasn't a code then. And should you have a screen? Yes. I think, think they're going to, they made me do it. In, in transfer of title, maybe? On transfer of no, title? No, it was after. Oh, the city came in and, and said you had to No, the inspector said, hey, you better put one of those things up there. And 200 bucks, so I did it. Sound like a... Sounded like an offhand comment to me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you ought to do that, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I should have made the house a call too. <laughs> I'll file that. All right. They added a balcony and a staircase to the side of this apartment building. So you're going to change that? You're going to fix that? What are you going to do with that? You know, the buyer has to decide what he wants to do with that. First thing I would do is I would make it supported better than that little, that little curly, cute little, little, uh, Piece of that dangle wood there. Yes. Can I ask you? You're putting a lot of this on what the buyer wants to do. If yes. You, if you have a seller, like I, I know somebody that's thinking about selling her house. She knows she has a kitchen that's unpermitted, and she's really worried about it. She's saying, should I come up with permits before I put my house on sale? What would you? What is your suggestion? To her? I mean, right now I would say you don't really have to do it in this market. I don't know, you know, but I don't know. Am I giving the wrong advice? You know. I'll tell you what I would say, and I'm not telling you what you should say as a realtor. I tell you what I would say. Everything should have a permit that should have a permit. That's what I would say. You know, should have a permit? Yes. Do you want to disclose that it doesn't? Well, that's up to you guys. But from your, from my standpoint, and maybe from your standpoint, you might suggest you really should have a permit on everything because you don't want something to be unsafe. We don't want them to move in, have a fire, and then they find out it was because it was bad faulty wiring, which was done during an unpermitted construction. That could come back to bite you because. You should know this too, that all construction, anyone who builds something, is responsible for it for 10 years. Okay. And if there's a fire and somebody gets hurt because of negligent construction, there can be criminal charges against whoever built that. Even if it's been disclosed. Disclosure has nothing to do with this situation. I'm saying that whoever built it can be responsible for whatever happens to the property. And they are responsible, by the way, you know, and can be held liable in certain situations. The owner would have a different liability. They didn't build it. Your, your client didn't build the kitchen. So it's not her responsibility from that standpoint. You know, she's not going to be personally responsible for someone's liability, but because it's going to go, go to the builder. But I would suggest to, to, that you would suggest to her that she really should have permit for everything. And what she does about that is up to her. But from your standpoint, you should officially say, I think you should permit. Yeah. 
Yes. You know, that may be true, but most sellers do not want to do that. They don't want to spend the money. Absolutely. It's much easier to just say, because you could lose them. I'm sorry. In reality, she no. could lose this seller. Most agents say, you know, we can disclose that it's non-permanent and that if you want to do something about it, that's fine. Here are your liabilities. But it's buyer's um, responsibility to research. You can say all of those things. And also Are say, you still liable afterwards? If no, you no, no. I'm just, that? All I'm saying is, I agree with you because you have those situations with real estate. You know, you're tr you're yeah, trying you to gu it. trying to guide the deal. You don't want to blow the deal. You don't want to blow it. And all I'm just saying is that you might want to say, you know, it always is best to have permits for everything. I you think it's sort best of to start that out in. that way. But you can move the other way and say, you know, oftentimes sellers don't have enough money, and in that case, we need to disclose that, and so the buyers know what they're getting in for, and that they could be liable later on to bring everything up to code. Yeah, and there are, there are other alternatives as well. You could leave money in escrow for that to be fixed with the express provision that that does get fixed with that money, you know. If so, indeed that's in the negotiations. I'm just saying there are ways to work around some of these things, like that thousand square feet that was added, you know. You might say, well, uh, we don't know, what, you know how this got built, whatever. Uh, but I, I'll leave, I'll leave five thousand dollars in the account for you to pay any fees involved, whatever. I mean, I'm just saying there are yeah, always ways to, to negotiate these kinds of things. You know, well, are they all successful? Not always. I mean, you got you're dealing with people. People have different viewpoints about everything. You know, if we ask everybody the same question in this room, or just to write it down, I'll bet we find you know fifty different answers. <laughs> well, I'll do different answers sometimes. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna fix this. I would fix it. You know, I would. Personally, I would at least make it stronger. You know, this is not an acceptable, you know, type of, of support. Okay, it would need better support, at least that. You know, so uh, yeah, because it's another one over here. See, these two. That's a critical weight point. Weight point here. People walking up the stairs. Let's say four, four or five people are, are jumping around on that on that balcony. It could be unsafe. So make it stronger. Um, get a permit. I don't know. I don't know. Personally, I wouldn't bother, but that's me. You have a buyer to him. You know, the buyer may be more concerned about things, and the buyer may not be concerned. It's up to the buyer. We're good? Uh -huh. All right, how about this one? <laughs> this is a real thing that happened right here in Venice, by the way. <laughs> Someone built a little sugar shack on top of the <laughs> That had to get taken down, and and, this, and look at the stairs, and look at the railings. I mean, come on. I like that. We we're talking about an unsafe situation in every aspect, you know. You know, so that's just that that had to get taken down. That had to be removed. Wow. All right. Now, what's incorrect about this one? See, now this this is the kind of thing of why you want to get permits, and also why when someone builds something quote to code but without a permit. No one ever inspected that to see what was wrong with it. And most of you here probably don't know what's wrong with it, so I'm gonna explain it to you. This is, well, this is a trap that's supposed to hold water. It holds water because gases come through from the other fixtures in the house and from the city, because it's all connected, it's an open, there's an open drain line to the city, and those gases can come up into the building. To stop them from coming up into your sink, so you smell them, that has water sitting in it. It's called a trap because it traps water. However, if you build it like this, as the water is flowing, it's going to draw the water, siphon the water out. This is called an S-trap. Es no bueno. Okay? <laughs> Can't have that. This, ha this should be extended down. It's called a tailpiece. Take the tailpiece take the tail piece down, put the trap here, and go straight out that way. That's all they had to do. Well, this guy didn't know how to do that, and he did it wrong. Contractor thinks he knows what he's doing, but he doesn't. It all oh, looks like brand new plumbing. And we go, oh yeah, new plumbing. But it's wrong. And how many of you have walked into a house and smelled the sewage in the house? And you don't know what's going on? That's what's going on. The traps are dry. Go put water in all the traps and stop right away. But fill, fill the sinks up because it's been sitting vacant for a while. Fill the sinks up and the smell will go away. Open the window. But that's a, called an S trap, and it's not good. You'd have to change that because that's good. That's dangerous. The gases come up, come up in the building and smell old fumes. Okay. Okay. This is a plumber with a sawzall. 
If you see a puddle that sells all, call the police. <laughs> yes, question. question. Like, on that incorrect gray line? Yeah, Can back you here. Say I, as an Asian, I can't tell whether that is incorrect, and the physical home inspector misses it completely. And we close escrow, and then buyer moves in, complaining, ah, oh, you know, he missed it, pay for it. Who's liable? Inspector. Okay. Is, there, is, there a limit, is there a statute of limitations? Yes. How long does that? Well, contract law, if you have a contract with the inspector, officially in, in California is two years. Yeah. All right? Um, you can limit that liability if you want to a year, or, but it's typically, the, the guy missed it. The inspector missed it. If my inspector missed it and they moved in, I'd pay for it. That's my personal opinion, my personal responsibility level, okay? And I paid for more expensive problems than, than that, that got missed, you know, half. <clears throat> but <coughs> you, you go back after the inspector for that. All right, so what's going on here? This was, this is a floor, underfloor area. This is a tub with a drain from the tub. And this is a 12 inch by three inch girder which is holding up the floor. Until the plumber came along and made it a six inch by three inch water. <laughs> you see this? A plumber with a sawzall? Oh, please. He doesn't need to be doing those kinds of things. If he's doing those kinds of things, he's screwing your house up. And that's an expensive repair. Okay? So, and you would never see that. You're not, no realtor here is going to go crawling under a house to find that kind of thing. And your inspector should be relied upon to find that. That's why you have inspectors. You should spot that, you should call that, and you shouldn't complain about it because you're saving yourself, you're saving your client a lot of money. Because if you miss it, it's expensive to fix it. But a, a correct trap. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> it's just that you decided to move the beam out of the way. Which I have no idea why you would have, but I, maybe you didn't have an elbow room or something. I don't know. All right, now here, this situation. Eagle Rock house. This is the house. This is the garage. Actually, the garage was back there, and they added on to the garage. But this is only five feet between the house and the garage, and that's a violation. Are you going to fix that? Probably not, because the buyers will probably accept it because they want the room that way and all that kind of thing. However, uh, it is a violation, and you you run the risk and roll the dice, you know, with that somebody. Because, but the thing is, that in that neighborhood, everybody had those kinds. Of, it's like Venice. Everybody has these kind of violations all over. And no one bat rats anybody out, unless, of course, you're ready to get to somebody, and then they get mad at you, and then they call them, you know, you kick them out, and then they call the Department of Building and Safety to make trouble. That can always happen. So you run, that's why you're rolling the dice. You have that situation. We good? Is it the entrance of the house? What's that? What's the entrance of In this situation, it's not going back. We have to go back forward. The, the, the entrance of the house was in the front, and the entrance of the garage to, the, to, that, uh, to that garage area, which was converted, was on the side. <laughs> the entrance to the house was in the front of that house, and the entrance to the garage slash converted area is uh, on the side. Now, if the garage was permitted, was it grandfathered in it? In this situation, the garage was like the one I showed you in the very early one, it was in the corner of the property and it had 10 feet from the house, but then they added on and added on and added on that burn close to the house and that wasn't okay. But they had that diagonal 10 feet, but once you come straight out, you have to encroach on, the side, on that side of the property, okay? Now, this is pretty obvious to me, but let me, let me explain. This is the driveway, there's the driver, oh, you know, the gate to the driveway, and the driver goes up, and what should be there? A garage. A garage. <laughs> it's no garage. So, you know, this is a very serious violation. You've got, you have no place to park the car except in the driveway. And um, you're supposed to have covered, uh, enclosed parking, and they don't have it. So, again, it's up to your buyer. Does your buyer want to live, it, live with it? Does your seller want to fix it before they sell it? And this is, these are the kind of questions that you're going to be asked. That's why I gave you as much information as I can about your options involved. Okay? Back to the gas situation, the uh, gases are coming out of that particular uh, uh, vent and can go into that window. If you, if you made that a fixed window that can't open, that'd be okay. But if that's an openable window, that's not okay. Can you just reroute the pipe and it looks silly? Yeah, you can reroute the pipe. Reroute it. Yeah, in this particular situation, 
they could easily reroute the pipe because this is a very high attic area and they could move the pipe over and bring it up over here. So it was very easy to handle. They handled it. Okay. What about this baby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This was permitted construction. This was old construction. This is new construction. Yeah. This got permitted and they didn't do anything about that. Wow. Wow. How the inspector missed that, I'll never know. But we find those kinds of things every single day of the week where the inspectors miss it. Okay? They just completely he ignored it. You know? Yeah, but why isn't it fixed? Time somebody's doing that. Maybe it was plugged up or something. Yeah. It could be. You know, if, if they could they could have capped it off. That could be. You're right. Uh, but maybe that's what happened because I, I don't know what, what the situation was exactly. But that's not okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. You, you Now that we're in, on chimneys for a minute because I'm seeing too many houses I will not buy that have blocked up chimneys, is it okay to unblock them? Do I, need a, I guess I need a permit to unblock it. Yes. I don't know about a permit to unblock a chimney unless, I mean, I, I don't know what the exact situation is. They just walled it over or something in front yeah. of it. Yeah, you know, it's just horrid. I mean, I see it all the time now in all the rehabs, so. Yeah, because they don't want to deal with it, huh? Right. Just want to, just want to, uh, and a lot of earthquake, uh, freedom required. Yeah, if they, they did, if they did seal it up, there was probably too much damage to the repair. You know, probably cost thousands of dollars, and they want to spend thousands of dollars, so it just rolled it off. Yeah. Was the insurance company covered because it was permitted? In this situation? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, if I was an insurance company, I'd probably say that I wouldn't cover that. But I, but I'm not the insurance company. Did they sue the city for permitting it? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> they have no liability whatsoever. The they might say, liability. sorry, we missed it. You know, that'd be about And you won't get that in writing. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Q&A, any questions? We're at the end of our talk. Well, well, well don't, inspectors uh, can be in suit, uh, can be sued. For, for, for not doing Civil servants have a lot of protection. I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, if I, he tells you to do that and you do it, and, it's, and, then, and then he retires, and another guy comes in and says, that's wrong. You know what? That happens. That happens? That happens. Uh, I actually had that happen to me on a building not too long ago, a commercial building I built. And we unfortunately didn't close the permit out before the inspector retired. Okay. And the new inspector wanted something that the old inspector was okay with, and we went around and around. But, but I, got, I got it solved because I stuck with it and I showed him what the situation was. If it's signed off, you, you sort of have a legal case. It hadn't been signed off yet, that was the problem. Okay. You know, yes. I have a question. Well, um, so I understand that you are not probably in the position to make actual estimates, but let's just. Just as a rough estimate, let's assume there's a condo that has an unpermitted bathroom and you want to permit the bathroom, get all the permits, do it properly, and so on. Just roughly, how much would the buyer or the seller have to budget for that? Are we talking a few a few thousand? Are we talking like 10,000? Is there To any? build the whole bathroom? Well, the bathroom is there, but it was built unpermitted in this case. So you want to It's going to depend on how, what they have to do to make it legal. All right. Uh, is the plumbing venting Let's legal? Let's just assume all of that was done properly, but legal. it's not official. You know, it wasn't done with permit, but it was indeed done properly. So just roughly, it's not it, going to be expensive. It would just be the cost. What does that mean? Two hundred bucks? Well, you got, first of all, you have, to, you have to do the drawings, okay. right? So whatever it costs for the architect or the designer or whoever to draw the drawings mm -hmm. to scale with everything there called as built. This is how it was built, okay. and you have to bring it to the city and then build. You'll pay three times the normal permit, typically. Okay, how much is a normal bathroom permit? It might, it just might be 150 bucks. Okay, so it could be in the hundred range. Bucks. It doesn't, wouldn't be a thousand. Plus the cost of the right. design. So it may, the whole thing might be a thousand dollars. I know so on this the one cut somewhere and you know, doing the, and see what's under it. Oh, do they want, yeah. Will the inspector want to look at certain things? Yes. yes. The inspector's going to want, if they can't see electrical, they can't see plumbing, they want something opened up, you have to do that, and that repair is going to have to be paid by the owner. Yes, hands going up. When you said um, you could go to a building inspector yes. and um, talk to him about telling him the address, can you find that stuff out? Like, can you explain to him, okay, I have a kitchen, new cabinetry, a wall was brought down. Can you tell me how much it's going to cost to bring this up to code? <laughs> if you're just waving your hands around saying it this way and all that, no, you can't do anything. But for I mean, you. let's say you have a plan. If you have a plan, 
and he can see how much, because remember now, most permits are going to be based on the cost of construction. There's a percentage of construction costs that they're going to charge you. So let's say it's 1%, for example. They would just charge you, he says, well, it looks like about $30,000 worth of work. We'll charge you 1% of that, 300 bucks. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So when it comes to, so, okay, I, I'm, on the, I'm not on the seller side of this equation at all. I am on the buyer side of this equation. Now that I'm running into this, particularly in all the houses I look, love, look at at Westlake and all that nonsense that are just, you know, they built it. It happens everywhere. I okay, so uh, I should, like, be negotiating to set aside a bunch of money that should last for a period of time that covers uh, unpermitted contingencies? Is that a, is that That's a, an option. Is that a fairly decent option in, like... A if fairly I, decent option is going to be up to the buyer and seller. Right. They're going to say whether it's good or good or bad. You're just going to propose things, and they're going to figure it out. Okay. You know, it, you you were waiting. So if a buyer goes to the city to get something permitted in the house that he just bought that was not permitted at the time, they will pay any fines that the city imposes. Is that a given that the city will impose fines? Typically. So they're responsible for that as well. If it was an unpermitted construction, it typically would charge you three times the cost of construction. Okay. Uh, permit. Yes. Just for information, any buyer can go to the city building online and look to see if a property is pulled permits and what permits they pull. Yeah, in most property. cities, certainly LA and Santa Monica, uh, and I don't know if the public cities is up on that yet, but there are other cities that have it and some cities don't where you can go and check what permits were pulled, when they were pulled, when they were signed up, or when they were not signed up. You can find out a lot of information online. Uh, like for LA, you would go to um, Department of Building and Safety, uh, LA Department of Building and Safety, I don't know the exact thing, but I guess. If you, if you look up LA Department of Building and Safety, it'll get you there. Yes? Uh, if you redo a kitchen set, yeah. Um, and you add fixtures to existing locations. You don't move gas, you don't move electrical. Do you need a permit to do the thing? If you don't move gas or electrical and you're just swapping out a sink or something like that, no. What no. about counters and cabinets? Yes. Counters, and ca counters and cabinets, no. no. That's just cosmetic. Electrical, plumbing, and structural. Okay, electrical, mechanical, and plumbing. Okay, now, we're actually at the end of our time. So, what I'd appreciate, I, we don't have to stop, but but in the meantime, those of you wanting to can leave, but I'd like for you to fill out your uh, your feedback form for me. It's important to me to have that documentation. So if you wouldn't mind, just everyone take a minute and just fill it out for 30 seconds. We're going to take you to do it. Thank you. While you guys are in the midst of doing that, my name is April Cass. And um, let's uh, give Sean a round Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John, I'm our marketing director, and I've put my email address here, so if there's a question that you have after the fact, and you want to have it answered, John or one of our other inspectors can't answer that for you if you email it to me. Um, anything that you did not get answered here today, or something pops into your mind tomorrow, or you run into a situation in the field and you go, I need some help from an inspector, or somebody who knows construction, or somebody who knows about this, email me and let me know. I I'll, also, I'll answer one thing oh. that if your client also has a question that you can't answer, that can happen as well. That's yes, and, and please, send those questions to us. We will take care of answering them as long as it's within our field of expertise and there's no fee to consult you on that type of stuff. We are happy to do it. Um, also, LaRoccaInspect.com or LaRoccaInspections.com is our website. And we have a page on our website that's specifically dedicated to contractors. Um, these are contractors that we know, that we refer. So if you're looking for someone to repair something on a property, it's a really great resource. I, I keep it up myself. If there's anybody on there that you're not happy with and you let me know about it, we get in contact with them. I try to just make sure it's the best people in the industry. So that's there as a resource as well. And I think that's all I want to say about that. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate that. You're welcome to stay in if you want questions.